But now we'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Patrick Newey. And he has, uh, for the past 40 years, uh, been actively involved in creation versus evolution issues in the field of geology. He speaks to college students at conventions and homeschooled conferences throughout the year. And in 2005, Patrick founded Northwest Treasures uh, to, to provide an opportunity to study geology from a biblical worldview. And in 2012, he opened Geology Learning Center, uh, which is a geology museum and educational center in Linwood. And Patrick leads field trips uh, all throughout the year and even goes to Yellowstone Park uh, once a year in April. So he invites us to uh, visit him and also join him on field trips. And we'd like to please now welcome Patrick. Test, test, okay, good. By the way, that field trip to Yellowstone is in August. And you couldn't get in in April. <laughs> so, yeah, feel free to join us. I won't be there in April, I can assure you. Um, <clears throat> let me get set up here. Uh, there we go. Secrets in the Rocks. Um, by the way, we do have a, a book, Rock Identification Field Guide, out on the table. This is my third edition um, of the, the book, and it's got over 500 color photographs in it, and it's twice the size of my other one. So it's uh, not just because I'm getting older that the words are getting bigger, it's, it's actually getting more material in it. So anyway, check that out. In fact, we do have it on special, by the way, it's a promotional here. Okay, secrets in the rocks. First of all, let me, let me just kind of sidestep uh, since it's that time of year, I want to do a kind of a shameless plug here for us. Northwest Treasures is a 501c3 organization, and as such, we do uh, rely a lot on people's generosity. Uh, some of you do your shopping online at Christmas uh, through Amazon, and um, you can participate in their program called Amazon Smile. We are a member of that, and uh, they take a portion uh, they, they, uh, a percentage of what you spend, they match it, and that goes to us. So that's a way you can give without uh, reaching any further into your pocket. It's a good way to do it. Uh, we do have opportunities, too, out on the table for one-time gifts or monthly giving, and we have some special uh, specials for you. Uh, also, too, you can join us at Facebook for uh, Giving Tuesday, November 28th. We'll have some specials on that too. So um, see my wife for a lot of that stuff in the back afterwards and um, she can give you that information. So hey, let's go ahead and start uh, Secrets in the Rocks. I have always been interested in rocks as far back as I can remember. Like most kids, uh, once it captured my attention, that was it. The rocks started coming home, buckets started getting filled and uh, that was the end of the story. <laughs> but uh, it, a lot of kids do, and uh, sometimes that interest gets stifled. Other times they just don't know what to do with it. Uh, sometimes it's, it's rather uh, discouraging and frustrating because we can't find materials that will explain the rocks from a biblical perspective. And so that's kind of what I want to do tonight is uh, look at the rocks and see some of the secrets that are held in these rocks uh, that um, secular geologists have ignored. So let's go ahead and begin. The modern interest in geology and rocks and fossils and dinosaurs really began in earnest through this man, James Hutton, in the late 1700s. Uh, he's called the father of modern geology, and uh, we'll share a few things with you tonight. You can see why he was called the father of modern geology. In other words, geology didn't begin until James Hutton, even though there were a lot of men before then who taught geology and were geologists. Uh, a lot of what I learned in secular geology was based on another geologist in the 1600s called Steno. Some of his principles of rock uh, identifying rock formations are still taught 
in secular geology. They just don't tell you where they're from. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of men who studied the rocks. But modern geology had its beginning in the late 1700s, and there's a, there's a real reason for that. Actually, James Hutton was better known during his time as a chemist. He had several uh, chemical inventions, and uh, he was quite a good businessman. He was a brilliant and accomplished Scotsman. So he was part of the whole system in, in Scotland during this time. He's also one of the leaders of the Scottish Enlightenment. And so that is going to be a little bit of a clue as to how he viewed the rocks. And we, so we want to pay attention to that. So what is this thing called the Enlightenment? <clears throat> well, during the period of 1700s, it was really a time of great questioning about the church, the scriptures, and God. All of this was being uh, questioned. In fact, this was a very big time in Western civilization. Uh, our whole culture today is a product of the Enlightenment. We are in post-Enlightenment times. Uh, we've taken the natural course, and it's yielded our whole culture today and what's happening to it. And it began really back here. Uh, the Enlightenment stressed the power of educated human reason to decipher the things of nature. Uh, it also stressed the importance of human reason combined with a rejection, this is very important, a rejection of any authority that could not be justified by human reason. Now, that's a loaded statement, but you can see where it's going. Uh, the scriptures were to no longer be trusted as the final authority on all matters of life and faith. Uh, it was up to human reason. And the Enlightenment gave us a new religion called deism. You, theism, of course, is an active belief in God and also that God is involved in our whole system. Deism takes it a step away and says, yeah, God is out there, but he's not involved in our world. He set laws to govern our whole uh, culture and our, our whole lives. And that was very strict deism. Obviously, there were a lot of variations of it. And that really drifted into the atheism that we have today. Uh, it was a, a natural course of, you don't hear the word deist much, although there are deist organizations around the country. Uh, deism was a uh, religion really in the 1700s and 1800s, a product of the Enlightenment. And really what happened with the Enlightenment was a whole new way of thinking about the world just burst onto the scene. And this was like a big garden event when uh, the serpent tested Eve and Adam, and uh, we fell. And that's, of course, we got our sinful nature from that. Uh, the Enlightenment was another one of those big garden events and it changed the course of everything from then on. Um, let me show you how drastic of a course this was. Anybody recognize this table? If you can, can you see that table? Uh, you've got on it, there are five events, five great or momentous events in history. The first one is the creation of the world, and it was listed as year zero. Uh, before Christ, 4,007 years before Christ. And then it goes on, the next greatest one was the deluge, or in uh, modern terminology, the flood. <laughs> and then it lists a few others. You have any idea where this chart came from? You might be very, very surprised. Look at this, Encyclopedia Britannica, 1771. Any of you have that on your shelf? 1771 edition. I'll tell you what, the modern edition won't have this. Completely rejected it. But this tells you what the culture was like. At the same time, Hutton was formulating his ideas based on the Enlightenment. Encyclopedia Britannica was still publishing the popular definitions and viewpoints and history in their encyclopedia to the culture. So culture was still here. This is what it was. And then the Enlightenment came in and literally booted all of this. The Encyclopedia Britannica goes on to describe the deluge. It says that this event was the most memorable event 
that was called the Universal Deluge, or Noah's Flood, which overflowed and destroyed the whole earth, and out of which only Noah and those with him in the ark escaped. There's no question about a local flood there, is there? I mean, this is Encyclopedia Britannica taught this. And, uh, of course, they no longer taught it or, or teach it today. Uh, the Enlightenment also gave us a modern consequence. I want you to think about this for a little bit because it may seem like I'm advocating no education. And I want you to know right up front, no, I, I believe in education, the right kind of education. But the product of Western education came from the Enlightenment. And they pushed this idea that the education of man was the noblest pursuit of an enlightened society. Now, there's, there's maybe some quarter truth to that, but here's where we left the mark. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the first real instruction in the book of Proverbs was this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It wasn't by way of human pursuits. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is where the enlightenment parted with the scriptures. And this is why we're in the mess today. The age of the earth is the biggest dividing point in the church today. And that's an issue of geology. That's not an issue of biology or chemistry. That's an issue of geology. And uh, it really began as a rejection of this kind of thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, Hutton lived in Scotland, and this was one of the big breakthroughs for him, this particular uh, rock formation. Uh, now, if this may not sound, I mean, it may sound a little silly to you, uh, but we as rock hounds, we do get fixated on these various formations, and we sit there and ponder it, <laughs> wonder what happened here. And so, this is what Hutton did. And he noticed that this formation had a couple of different interesting things about it. First one what it had, uh, is that it had horizontal red sandstone. Um, and uh, then it had another group of sandstones called gray wacky. That's a uh, carryover from Europe. We still call it gray wacky today. It is a coarse uh, sandstone. And these were vertical. And he noticed, wow, these were these were two different events. And uh, he concluded that these were an unconformity. In other words, it wasn't layered horizontally all the way down. You had an event of horizontal deposition. And then he thought there was a group of vertical dep uh, deposition. And um, you can see the little illustration down there. It's called an angular unconformity. And so as he contemplated these rock formations around Scotland, just like this, he had other questions. How do mountains form? All of us have asked that. In fact, there's a book in the national parks, and uh, it's called Mama, Where Do Mountains Come From? That's the name of the little book, little kid's book in the national park system. We all have these kinds of questions. Uh, <clears throat> another one he had was, how is new rock created? And a third one is, how old is the earth? Now, think about those questions for a minute, because you might even be tempted to say, well, I don't know, let's see what the pros have to say. And so we, we go on over to the secular geologists, and we ask them, after all, they're the educated ones. They are the ones that are supposed to know. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why you have the biggest split in the church today over the age of the earth. Why should that be a problem? It is so easily stated in Genesis how old the earth is. And it doesn't take a whiz bang in math to figure it out. But, oh, no, we can't do that, though, because this is where the seed of knowledge is. And uh, so this is what Hutton concluded. What he did was he took his questions and he rejected the scriptures, the scriptural answer, in favor of human reason. And consequently, <clears throat> his <clears throat> reason became very, very uh, uh, faulty. First thing was that he reasoned <clears throat> that geological processes such as erosion and deposition do not change over time. Well, what does that do? With one stroke of the pen, that eliminates the flood. 
is the flood would have definitely caused a big shift in how things went in, in earth history. Second of all, he reasoned that the same geological processes shaping the earth today have been at work throughout earth history. It obliterates the flood. And this is what you learn in secular geology. This is what I was trained in. This is how you're, you're trained to view the world. They start out by building a world view into you. And then you learn the science at some other point. And then he reasoned that these processes must have been going on for a long, long time to produce Sicker Point there in Scotland. And he, one of his conclusions was the earth must be older than what the Bible records. And he published this. And of course, this began to cause a lot of stir in the church. So you've got this guy saying this, and Encyclopedia Britannica saying this over here. And you see the war developing, culture, and what was coming out of the elite establishment. He went on to say, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. As he looked at rock formations, he concluded they took a long time to form, to get that way, and they would wear down, produce other kinds of rock. Those rocks would come back and produce formations and so on and so forth. And as far as he could tell, there was no beginning and no prospect of an end, that the Earth's geological process would go on and on and on. That was the natural way of looking at things. His greatest error was this conclusion. The past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. Can you see that? You see that's where modern geology is. A complete rejection of anything that is not naturalistic. That should ring a bell with you because it does. The resurrection was not a natural event. It was an unnatural event, and it is not accepted in science. This is a, it's a belief that is irrelevant, has nothing to do with the geological history of the Earth. It's in your head. And, of course, if that's true, you and I don't have a faith, do we? I mean, as Paul said, we are all people. We are all people are the most to be pitied as we believe in this wacko story. So he published his ideas in a book in 1795 called The Theory of the, the Earth. It's still in print today. They just keep printing it. One of those few books that's endured in the last 200 and some odd years. The Theory of the Earth. Here's the complete title of it, by the way. They were very flowery in those days. And the complete title is The Theory of the Earth or an Investigation of the Laws Observable in the Composition, Dissolution, and restoration of land upon the globe. By the time you sort that title out, <laughs> they're already past. <laughs> that, that, is quite a, that is quite a title, isn't it? Well, this new law that he proposed was this idea called uniformitarianism. And uh, anything with an ism on the, on the end, you should realize it's going to take belief. An ism is a belief and yet it's treated as fact in secular geology. Here are some principles of uniformitarianism. First of all, that erosion caused by streams and wind could also wear down mountains. Now, we all observe erosion, don't we? You're battling it around your house every year. Try to keep your, your house from slipping into wherever it is especially here in Washington. The ground just seems to be moving all the time. So we do see erosion at work, don't we? The real question is, have you seen it wear down mountains? That's the real question. Second of all, these processes would take a long time to accomplish this, certainly more than what the Bible taught. He was aware of the age of the earth as taught by the Bible. It was no confusing thing to him. He knew that he, if he was going to be a biblical Christian, he knew that was one of the things he had to accept, was a young age of the earth. Today, it's just kind of optional, isn't it? You have a list of 
What are your 10 things you like to believe about the Bible? Oh, that's good. What about you? What about you? And we've got this hodgepodge of beliefs that some of them don't really make that much difference what we do in our lives. Now, uh, another principle of uniformitarianism is that the earth was developed by erosion, transportation, and deposition of sediments bit by bit, year by year, over a very long time. There you have the history of the earth, earth history. And Hutton was the one who gave us this device called the rock cycle. Many of you have, know, know this. Some of you have even taught it to your kids in homeschooling. I don't know of any Christian geology textbook that doesn't teach the rock cycle. I've looked through them. They teach it. And uh, the problem is, when you look at it, you see three rock types, and you see weathering going on. One rock slowly changes into another rock and uh, becomes something else, and that rock is heated by way of magma, and that produces another kind of rock, and so on and so forth. You see the cycle? Here are the questions that we should be asking. Number one, how much of this cycle has been observed? That's a good question, isn't it? Another question is, where is the origin and where is the end? It is. It's, a, it's just one of these cycles. They treat it like the carbon-oxygen cycle or other life cycles that we see that are observed. But the rock cycle has not been observed. It's been assumed. That leads us to the first secret. Are you ready? The first secret in the rocks is this. The rock layers do not have dates stamped on them. This was a real eye-opener for me. As I was out one day uh, doing some fossil hunting, I picked up a fossil, and all of a sudden it was like an epiphany. Uh, I was lost. How old is this rock? It doesn't have any dates on it. I couldn't match it up to any particular scale. What, what is, how old is it? Well, the, the part of this secret is that the history of the rock layers must be interpreted. Now, I know some of you are saying, okay, Nuri, what about radiometric dating? You thinking that? <laughs> well, that leads us to secret number two in the rocks, and that is this. Radiometric dating is determined by uniformitarianism. The part that's science in radiometric dating is radioactivity. That's the science. Uh, there, there is radioactivity. The assumption about the time involved is assuming that what you're seeing right now has continued unchanged into the past. That is uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. That's the second secret. And if we can hang on to that as we have discussions with people, we can ask them, how sure are you that the radioactive processes have gone on for uh, 4 billion, 8 billion, 15 billion years? How sure are you? Has that ever been shown to be science? Now, Hutton's uniformitarianism, this may surprise you, was developed, the idea that the Earth was ancient, millions of years old. They didn't know exactly how old. No one had stuck a number on it. That wasn't to come about really until the next 30 years or so. And they began adding numbers to it. But Hutton's uniformity, uh, uniformitarianism was developed 100 years before radioactivity was even discovered. So they didn't have radiometric dating. They didn't have radioactivity. At least, I mean, they had it, but they didn't know what it was. Uh, and so the ages for the Earth were not determined by radioactive, uh, radio, radiometric dating. They were determined by a philosophical outlook. And we miss that a lot of times today. Actually, it was this man here. Do you, you know the name of this man? Any of you? He's one of these unsung heroes in, in the science world. Uh, do any of you know who this guy is? Uh, he's very, really an important man in the science world. And his name is Arthur Holmes. In 1911, he developed the first radiometric age for the Earth. It was one billion, the Earth was one billion years old. 
And now I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, I learned that it was 4.6 billion. You're right, that's what it is today. Which begins to tell you that perhaps we don't know that much about the radiometric dating systems. How can it change from one billion? And they're using the same radiometric dating method today. The uranium lead system. It's one of those that is commonly used today, especially for older, uh, what they think are older ages. But Hutton had decided 100 years before that the Earth was old, not based on any kind of science. Now, <clears throat> modern geologists, that's kind of the introduction to, we're going to get into the rock types now, and some more secrets. This is what you've been waiting for, isn't it? Modern geologists organize the rocks, and I didn't realize this as a kid, but they organize the rocks based on how they think the rocks were formed. Well, is that science or philosophy? I, I thought it was science. But if they're, if, how do we know if they're basing their organization on the rocks around the idea that they originated such and such a way, how do they know this? This is a very important question for me. It was a part of what led me to doing some more research when I was in college. Of course, in college, you know, it's a ripe, a ripe rebellious age. You begin to question everything. And in this way, it worked, it worked for me. <laughs> uh, how do they know this? So they group according to three rock types. Now, all of you have heard this. All of you have been taught this. And all of you, have, most of you have probably taught it to your kids. Kids, you pick up the book in the library on rock types. And what do they tell you? Well, there are three rock types. One is the igneous rocks. Who can tell me what an igneous rock is? Anybody know what the word means? What does the word igneous mean? Fire, sure. We get the word ignite from it. Uh, igneous rocks, so they think that all of these types of rocks were formed by fire. Now, what do they include in those igneous rocks? Well, they include granite. They picture granite as being formed from hot magma deep under the earth and, coming, uh, and cooling over hundreds of millions of years. And then they also lump into the igneous rocks the lava rocks formed from hot magma that is extruded onto the earth's surface. Now, based upon science, or upon observation, which one of these is the true igneous rock? Lava. We've seen lava form. In fact, you, you get on your internet tonight and type in Kilauea. And you can watch the lava flows over in Hawaii. And so we know exactly uh, how they're produced. And uh, I've seen demonstrations where they've melted lava rock and then poured it out and let it cool, then you can see it turn back into rock. So we, we know these are the true igneous rocks. Well, what do we do with granites then? Because no scientists have ever seen granite form. We assume that it was formed from hot molten magma deep under the earth and cooling over millions of years. How do we know that? Well, we don't. So it's not science. It's actually a type of philosophy. We'll get into it a little bit uh, more here a little bit later. So those are the lava rocks. Which one of these has been seen, observed to be forming? Well, it's, of course, the lava rock. Then geologists have another rock type called metamorphic rocks. The word metamorphic means change form. It's actually a, a biblical word. You know where that occurs? How many of you know your Bible real well here? You in Romans chapter 12, don't be uh, conformed to this present world, but be metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind. That's the Greek word. Be metamorphosed. Be changed, completely changed through the renewing of your mind. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> they view metamorphic rocks as those rocks changed by heat and pressure deep underground over hundreds of millions of years. Um, have we seen that? No, no geologist has ever seen metamorphic rocks form. And we group metamorphic rocks, geologists do, into two different types. Nice, uh, these are foliated, meaning they're in bands or in layers. 
foliated metamorphic rocks formed from pre-existing rock through heat and pressure over millions of years. That, there's a piece of gneiss there on the lower left. You can see what it looks like. It's a common rock around Washington, and there's a lot of this up in the Cascades. Uh, and then there's marble. It's non-foliated rock formed from pre-existing rock through heat and pressure over millions of years. Neither one of these have been seen to be forming. No one's ever seen marble form. No one's ever seen uh, nice form. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff being done in the laboratory. That is not a good comparison, because now we've just introduced intelligence and an unnatural environment, right? Yeah, so those are out. <laughs> they also show, if we've done a lot of this stuff in the laboratory, <clears throat> It shows you how quickly they can be formed, not millions of years. And then a third rock type are the sedimentary rocks, rocks formed from the accumulated sediments over millions of years. And we group, the, as geologists, we group the, se the sedimentary rocks into three different kinds. The clastic sedimentary rocks, which are like sandstone. They're formed from either wind-blown sediments and or deposited by shallow seas over millions of years. Little bits and pieces of quartz crystal accumulated together and cemented together form sandstone. And a second type of rock are the biochemical sedimentary rocks. These are uh, rocks like fossil limestone. And uh, by the way, it's probably good to point out here that you cannot directly date sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are dated by another principle in uniformitarianism called biostratigraphy. There's a mouthful, isn't it? Biostratigraphy. Well, that is really a belief that the order of life's evolution is written in the rocks. And uh, so they take life, assuming it evolved from simple to com complex, and they organize it that way. See, the people don't realize that the geologic timetable is not an actual fact of science. It is a, a contrived mechanism that's put together based on a belief that life arose from simple and evolved and developed all the way up to complex. And so the different rock layers are put together this way. They're organized this way. Now, it is true that we find some rock layers with fossils in them. But um, the most complete, really, is in the Grand Canyon. And there's, there's over a billion years of missing time and rocks in the Grand Canyon. So it doesn't really serve to be a good timepiece. But that's biostratigraphy. Guess what? Secret number three. <laughs> biostratigraphy is determined by uniformitarianism, that life evolved from simple to complex. And the changes that we see going on in life today are sufficient to explain all the diversity in the past. That's a uniformitarian principle. And so that's a secret uh, in, uh, as, we look at, as we look at the rocks. A third type of sedimentary rock are the chemical rocks, like travertine. Now, travertine, if you go to Yellowstone Park and you visit Mammoth Hot Springs, the kind of rock you're seeing that's building up on those terraces in Yellowstone uh, is travertine. And uh, some of you have this on your bathroom floors or somewhere in your house. By the way, if you have a black light, uh, turn off the lights and put the black light on the travertine, you may get some fluorescent glow. <laughs> but uh, travertine is a chemical sedimentary rock. No fossils in it. It's produced from a type of limestone. So secular geologists teach that the rocks tell us the Earth is billions of years old. That's what they teach. Here's the key, though, to coming up with that answer, and that is interpretation. The rocks don't tell us that. We tell the rocks to tell us that. It's called interpretation by way of a framework of uniformitarianism. That's a framework that geologists use today, secular geologists use today, to interpret the rock layers. So since we're playing around with frameworks here, 
I'm going to introduce to you another framework that you can use that's just as philosophically valid. It's not science, but it is on the same plane now as the framework in secular geology because it is a philosophical outlook, a worldview. It just doesn't have all the religious words in it. Well, here's my biblical framework for interpreting the Earth's rock layers. It's the biblical framework. And you can see there are only really four parts to it. It's a very simple biblical framework. You can see there involves the creation, the pre-flood world, the flood, and the post-flood period, which we are now in. All this encompasses about 6,000 years. Well, wait a minute, how do I know this? It can't be proven with science, can it? I can't go back and, and redo the creation. I can't go back to the laboratory and reconstruct the creation. So, okay, there's my proof. Ah, but biblical framework is history. And it was given to us by revelation. And that has been uh, corroborated through the years by various prophets and teachers in the scripture. It is recorded history. It claims to be recorded history. The Bible is not a book of feel-good poetry. It is a historical book. And it's also been verified by Jesus. To me, that kind of puts the, the lid on it right there. Now, if the flood was a historical event, guess what? It would have completely altered the surface of the earth and its crust. So that what we're looking at today is nothing like what existed before the flood. It didn't gradually get to this place. It was done by a huge, catastrophic, massive flood about 4,500 years ago. We don't have a clue, really, what the pre-flood world looked like. We've got some good imagination. There may be a few... A few uh, guesses here and there, but the pre-flood world was wiped out. I can take you to places in uh, Montana, for instance, where I can show you limestone mountains that are estimated to be over 20,000 feet thick. Now, that limestone is a sedimentary water-based rock, is a product of the flood. I would think that if you're going to find anything from the time that Adam and Eve existed, it might be under 20,000 feet of limestone in that particular place. It may not be. But God's intention, of course, was to wipe man from the face of the earth. And so the rocks that we see today, most of them are really as a result of the rearrangement processes of the flood, done very, very rapidly, quickly. So, wait a minute, Nuri, the Genesis flood, that's not science. Well, neither is uniformitarianism, is it? Uniformitarianism is an idea. And this brings us to secret number four. The Bible is history. <laughs> and uniformitarianism is, uh, uniformitarianism is not history. It's an idea. It's a, ph a philosophy. There are no records about uniformitarianism. We have, uh, we have begun to keep records today, but if the flood took place, which is recorded history, then that records an entirely different set of geological principles. And if we ignore that, you end up in the same place that Hutton ended up. And that has deceived millions and millions of people since then. And that's the cost of the Enlightenment. Now, geology is the study of the Earth, and that involves two aspects. It involves the physical chemistry of the Earth, and when we look at a rock, our primary interest is really what's, what's it made of, and that's the science part of it. And then the second part of geology is the origin of the Earth. That's the history, the physical history, and now we start getting into philosophy. Here's the confusing part in geology today. And this is what I spend most of my time as I teach parents and kids. This is where I spend most of my time, is helping them sort out this. Modern geology teaches both the physical science and the history as a package deal, and they call it earth science. Well, in actuality, you have the science of the earth, 
and you have the history of the earth. Those belong two different departments. So we have science over here, and around the corner we go on to the history building, and we can speculate about the history of the earth. But to teach it in science department, it really should be a no-no. And we should help our kids see this. One of the most difficult things your kids will learn is how to keep those two things straight. But that is the key, I believe, in your apologetics with people that you talk to that are so convinced the Earth is 4.6 billion years and that science has proven it. If we can get to help them sort out what aspects of what they're saying is, is history and philosophy and what aspect is science, uh, you've got a chance then of erasing some of this stuff. So let's reorganize the rocks. We're going to take our viewpoints here. Well, first of all, we're going to look at the science, and this is what I do. I organize, first of all, rocks into four groups. Uh, one group is the Plutonic rocks. The word Plutonic comes from the word Pluto. This is actually a, a secular geologist also agrees with this. Pluto meaning God of the underworld, and uh, the continental crust of the Earth is mostly made up of granites. You can see those here. Those are what we call the coarse-grained rocks. In other words, you can see the mineral crystals. So we're going to organize rocks based upon their physical appearance. And the first group are going to be the coarse-grained rocks. Now that doesn't say anything about their origin, does it? Because we're dealing with the science here. We're going to organize plutonic rocks. These are all over the place because uh, the most abundant rock in the crustal portion of the Earth. Uh, and then we're going to take the second group of rocks and we're going to call those volcanic rocks. Those are the true igneous rocks. And again, we're going to look at their physical appearance. Those are the fine-grained rocks. Did you see the difference? You notice the difference between these and the plutonic rocks? See those? Those are, you can see the minerals. In the volcanic rocks, you cannot see the minerals. And this is consistent across the board. So again, it says nothing about their origin, but we're going to organize them according to appearance. And then the metamorphic rocks, again, the physical appearance, shows that they've been changed or distorted in some way. And you can see the gneiss on the left and the schist. Kids, you've got to be real careful about that word. Say it very slowly. The schist on the, on the right-hand side, these are rocks that look distorted or changed in some way. But they're different than other rocks. And then the sedimentary rocks, we're going to also organize according to appearance. And these range from fine clay shales up to coarse grain sediments like conglomerates. These are little bits and pieces of rocks. They've been glued together. Doesn't say much about their origin. Again, organizing according to physical appearance. Then also the sedimentary rocks include the rocks with the fossils in them. Uh, most fossils are found in sedimentary rocks. That should really begin to give you a clue as to the origin. But for now, uh, a lot of limestone, shale, sandstone, they all contain fossils. Many of them do. So let's take a look at our second, uh, or a second look at our basic biblical framework, and we're going to discover secret number five in the rocks, and that's this. 73% of the Earth's land surface consists of sedimentary rocks. Now, wait a minute. Sedimentary rocks are water-laid rocks, mud, all mud at one time. Wow, could the flood have something to say about that? I think that's consistent with the scriptural biblical framework. A big, massive flood would have churned up all kinds of sediments around the Earth and laid them down in massive amounts of layers. Think of the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon was, is a flood-created uh, formation. 
And then um, I happened to see that the big canyon, the big gash in those sedimentary rocks that were laid down by the flood were really produced by the recessional part of the flood. When it tore in, the water was coming off the earth and it tore in to freshly laid sediments and left a big gash. But those rock layers, massive amounts of shale and sandstone, limestone. In fact, it's part of the Colorado Plateau, which includes over 60,000 square miles. That's actually more like about 130,000 square miles of sedimentary flood-borne rock. It incorporates Utah and Colorado and Wyoming, parts of Texas, New Mexico. Grand Canyon is just a portion of the Colorado Plateau. And it's all this sedimentary rock. So keep your eyes peeled when you see these big sedimentary formations. And um, ask yourself if there's a better way. We don't see them being laid down today that way. They have to have been laid down in a process that we don't observe today to get that kind of sedimentation. Secret number six is in the plutonic rocks. The plutonic rocks are the coarse-grained rocks, and in those coarse-grained rocks, we're discovering radio halos. Those are a result of, of radioactive decay. Radio halos and zircons in the biotite micas, and you can see the black biotite mica there, in the granites. And what these are indicating is that the granites were formed either a short time ago or very rapidly. If you want a good book to read, it's still valid today. This is one of the first books I read as a believer. It was put out in the 70s called Creation's Tiny Mystery. Ron Payne may have that book on his uh, table out there, Creation's Tiny Mystery. Uh, Robert Gentry has not been able to get a job since then because of this book. He is a nuclear physicist and one of the a brilliant nuclear physicists. In fact, today he's still considered the authority on radio halos. Those, those circular things you see on the left up there, those are halos that are as a direct result of radioactive decay. And uh, he's done thorough research. He got a paper somehow published, that's quite a story, in the Nature magazine in the 70s. And I remember when that came out, I was just a young believer, and it just, uh, it, was a, um, it was a thrilling thing to see this because it has, has stood the test of time. It has never been overturned. And he is considered the authority on radio halos today. So if you can get that book, Creation's Tiny Mystery, it's his story. He, used, uh, he was a physicist with the uh, Oak Ridge Laboratory and um, uh, after he published this paper, nobody wanted anything to do with him because of the, uh, uh, the, the problems he was causing. Uh, physicists saw right away what his research was showing. The Earth was very, very young. And the granites were not formed by slowly cooling magma over millions of years. Now, secret number seven is in the metamorphic rocks. The distortion of the metamorphic rocks could have been caused rapidly by movement and friction generated in the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep. Are any of you from Minnesota or Michigan in here? Yeah, I'm from Minnesota. Uh, I bet you didn't know that there was a 1,200 mile gash under Minnesota, Iowa, a little part of Kansas and Missouri and Michigan, 1,200 mile gash below Lake Superior. And uh, people have wondered a long time, why do you find so many volcanic rocks around Lake Superior? This is why. This was one of those rifts. In fact, it is called the Mid-Continent Rift. This is what a rift is. It's a big gash. You see another one, if you go over to Israel, you see another one that expands from Africa all the way through the Middle East. And that's what the Jordan Valley is, part of the big rift. And the remnant is the Salt Sea and the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. It's a huge, it's a huge rift. And at the northern part of that, I was very surprised when I went there and uh, searched around Capernaum and Chorazin. 
there are volcanic rocks. In fact, all of the buildings they've excavated around those two cities are all made of volcanic rock. It was the rock most available. Well, wait a minute, there are no volcanoes in Israel, at least active ones. There are some in the, uh, if you go down into the Negev Desert, you can see some volcanic necks down there. People don't recognize them. Of course, an idiot like me, I would recognize them right off, you know. Hey, look at that. Look at what? Well, that's a volcanic neck. You know, it's one of these things that it, it really is, it really floats my boat to see something like that. Not too many people are thrilled with volcanic necks. <laughs> but these, these are remnants of what took place during the flood. And this mid-continent rift is part of a 1,200 mile long gash in the earth. Isn't that interesting? Secret number eight in the volcanic rocks, the amount of lava is being produced today actually tell us that uniformitarianism will not work to explain things like the lavas of the past, the Columbia Plateau. You are living on that thing today. That thing is 60,000 square miles of lava that in some places is 6,000 feet deep. That is a lot of lava. Hawaii doesn't show that much going on today. In fact, the lava flows that have covered some of the towns in Hawaii, you can now walk across because they're cooled and their tops of sign sticking out. <laughs> so the kind of lava that's evident in the Columbia Plateau is a clear indication that we had different processes going on in the past. And uniformitarianism cannot explain them. That's a real secret in things like this. There's another one almost twice the size over in India called the, uh, the Khan Traps or the lava flows. Huge lava flows over in India. It takes up, it covers, what is it, about a fourth of India? Huge lava flows. And uh, the Columbia Plateau is, is quite large. Secret number nine is found in the sedimentary rocks. The billions of fossils in the sedimentary rocks simply cannot be explained by uniformitarianism because petrification today is minimal at most. And what has been produced is due to environment, not time. Let me give you an example. Well, here in these two, you can see disarticulated uh, fossil bones on the left. And on the right, you can see thousands of marine fossils that have been jammed together. In the museum that I have in Linwood, I've got a whole table of these things just laid out. They're just billions of marine fossils. That doesn't happen today. In fact, no one has seen it happen. Uh, you'll see fish die, you'll see marine creatures die, but for them to become petrified takes unusual circumstances. They've gotta be buried quickly. They got to be free from oxygen. They got to be free from bacteria. That really only comes about because of a catastrophic process. Now, here's an example of a substance that's being produced in the laboratory. There's a bunch of these kinds of examples. Diamonds made from peanut butter. Uh, husbands, I'm giving you an out this year. <laughs> this is one of the most Guilty times in the year for me. You're watching TV and how many ads do you get for, you know. Uh, you're you're going to buy this for your wife because she doesn't act like this over a sweater. <laughs> yeah, it shows her just jumping up and down. <laughs> and they've got a diet. Well, yeah, diamonds aren't that special. Look, we can make them out of peanut butter. Here's your jar of Skippy for Christmas. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, though? We can petrify things very quickly, not because of time. That's what I was taught as a kid, that it took time for things to fossilize. No, it takes the right chemical environment. And that's one of these secrets. Now, every secular earth science book begins with, in the beginning, 15 billion years ago. I've got uh, tons of these books on my shelf. And you open up the book, and there it is in the beginning. And it goes back to the Big Bang. 
Now, here's a good question. Kids, you can start practicing on yourselves now. So what are we going to say about this, the Big Bang? Well, I think we need to consider those questions. And here's the question we need to ask. What about this statement is science? What about the Big Bang has been observed, tested, and repeated? Big Bang then qualifies as an idea. And it's also based around uniformitarianism. The universe is observed to be expanding today. So therefore, in the past, it was once a tightly wound something that um, came apart and gave us the universe that we have today. That's a uniformitarian principle. You see how much this has been affecting us over the last 200 and some odd years? Isn't this something how this just grabbed a hold of our culture and is entrenched? It will never leave. Our, our culture has bought into it. What we've got to do is become sharp and focus on the people who uh, will listen. Uh, you're, you're just not going to get the colleges to change. I really feel, I used to spend a lot of time on colleges, college campuses doing this kind of thing. I think we've lost the college campuses. Uh, but we've not lost the youth. That's the other side of that coin. And uh, it's going to take kids, it's going to take you in the future mastering some of these concepts so that you can begin to challenge some of the thinking. What we're really involved with here is this. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 10, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. There are no crusades here. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. See, what kind of knowledge did Hutton produce? It was knowledge based on human reason, and it raised itself up against the knowledge of God. This is what we're involved in today. Listen to this amazing statement. This is by a, uh, a well-known geneticist. He said, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That's exactly what Hutton said in 1795. You cannot allow any other principle to interpret the earth history other than those that are naturalistic materialistic to the globe. And so I advocate that we get back to this. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is trustworthy, it's simple, and it is uh, explanatory. So why don't we pray and just want to remind you again, we have lots of resources out there, especially for the kids. Some of your parents are probably wondering too. Actually, I sell more of my books to the parents than I do to the kids. Is they're saying, wait a minute, I need to know this stuff. There's a lot of equipping type materials out there. So why don't we go ahead and pray. Lord, we do want to just close our time today. We ask you to help us renew afresh our commitment to know your word, to know your creation, to study your works, and to communicate your works. We're reminded of that passage. You've given a flag to those 
who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. And uh, Lord, that's our calling, really, for all of us. And we ask you to help us this week uh, take a little bit closer step toward being equipped. Amen. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I almost forgot. <laughs> we'll take some time for questions. If, uh, yeah, oh yeah, no, you, that's fine. You sure. don't mind doing that. No. Uh, so anybody's thinking of a question, you can be thinking of that. And uh, we do have an announcement from Gerda from Heinz, and I'm looking at uh, Gloria's cell phone. So this was 30 minutes ago, 45 minutes ago, and he's out of surgery, really went well, no cancer, closing him up, uh, be able to see him in an hour, and... We'll be here till Sunday. Praise the Lord. So that's that's yeah. where I is. <clears throat> so that was a moving message there. It's well, hey, geology is that is it's tectonic. Yeah. So if there's any questions, <laughs> we'd like to uh, take the opportunity to ask questions, and uh, we'd also like to take a free will offering now, and remember that we're a 501c3 organization. You can make checks payable to. Uh, apologetics forum and thank you so much for your donations and uh, is there any questions or are there any questions so that large volcanic um, deposition across the United States the mid-continent rift States, yes yeah so uh, what is the explanation that they give for it that there's just a lot of because whenever you see something in cartoons or uh, uh, TV sorts of things, the beginning of the earth was, was a lot of volcanoes. Yeah, yeah, that, and it sure is. Yeah. yeah. So is that their explanation that there were yeah, just Yeah, it's part of, of the initial forming of the earth when it was once uh, molten magma and, and, and lava and so on. It's one of the ways they use, this is one of the reasons they uh, use that explanation because there is so much lava on the earth. Can, do you know of a passage of scripture, though, that would go counter to that? There's a specific passage in the New Testament that goes completely counter to that. As a kid, I used to get books from the Horizon Book Club. You remember that? And uh, Weekly Reader. And the little books I'd bring home, the golden books, biggest pieces of heresy there are. <laughs> they clogged our minds as kids. <laughs> And I got one on the beginning of the earth, and it started out molten lava and rock and all these you know, artist renditions and so on. Boy, those left impressions in my head. But there is a specific passage of scripture that goes totally contrary to that. It's in Second Peter chapter 3, and Peter says it escapes their notice that the earth was created out of water and by water, not lava. And in fact, you go back to Genesis 1, what do you see? God created the space and the earth. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep, which is water. So it was water. It agrees with what Peter, or Peter agrees with what Genesis was saying. So the earth began in water. Now, we then would look at this rift. A rift is a crack in the earth. And we'd say, wait a minute, there's a better explanation for this, and it fits the historical framework. That is, that when the fountains of the great deep burst open, they left rifts all over the world. And this is one of them. Any other questions? Well, we thank you again sure, for yeah. being here. And, you, and uh, Patrick will be uh, back at his table and look at the resources you yep, have there. And sure will. Give him another hand. And remember, next month on December the 8th, and that's just three weeks away, we'll have another meeting, uh, <clears throat> which uh, will close our year out, and then we'll start, <clears throat> excuse me, start the next year with uh, uh, Dr. Carter. So in closing, I'd like to thank everybody again for being here and invite you to have refreshments uh, with us and some cookies. And remember to fellowship with each other and see Patrick and his wife, Vicki, and uh, all of us to have a blessed and safe Thanksgiving. And I'd like to ask uh, Pastor Rick Long to close us in a word of prayer.
Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just holding before us your truth and your word, and then as we can observe it in your world, how we pray that we would grow in wisdom, understanding your truth and our ability to defend your truth to others in our lives and just to rejoice in it ourselves. Thank you for Patrick and sharing tonight. Bless our fellowship together. But Lord, we do also pray for Heinz. Thank you so much for bringing him safely through this surgery. Bless his recovery now and restore him to full health soon uh, to go about uh, the many different aspects of the work that he does to glorify your name, to undergird this ministry and to bring your truth to others in other settings so faithfully. So bless us on our way now. Bless our fellowship. As we pray all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being here. God bless you on your way.